Legal Affairs Division. We also have the Special Director in the Office of the National Director, uh, Advocate Ntunzi Maga, who is also the spokesperson, the national spokesperson for the NPA. So um, those are the people that are, are with us on this briefing this morning. So going back to how we are proceeding with this, uh, with this briefing is, um, of course, the, the, the resignation of Advocate Hemian Cornier has um, really overtaken everything. Um, after we, we had planned to talk about progress on, on all NPA issues that the national director feels is it's really important for us to actually keep um, the public updated. For that reason, uh, the national director will start addressing the issue around Advocate Hemian Cronier's uh, resignation. There have been a number of questions throughout the weekend, and she did commit to just really addressing as much as possible um, issues around that, that, um, that resignation. And uh, we will give it a short, a short time because, of course, you, we did say that this is, isn't really about you know, communicating around that, but it's important. It's in the media space. So we will give it a f about 15 minutes where the national director will um, talk about it and then we will allow questions and answers. And then when, once that's done, then we will proceed with the rest of the briefing and get to the end of the, of, of the session that way. Um, thank you very much, colleagues. Um, with that all said, I hand over to the national director. Thank you very much, Mulelwa, and good morning to members of the media. Um, Firstly, let me confirm what Bulawa has just said and that this media briefing was scheduled some time ago. As you know, members of the media, we had a, the, our first engagement with the media. It was last year. And we were hoping to have uh, yearly media briefings, engagements or roundtables with the media to update you on the work of the, of the NPA. Um, the first one was actually scheduled in June this year, the follow-up one, but because we went into the third wave, we were not able to do it, and then it got postponed, and so we then scheduled this one. Um, so so um, members of the media and colleagues, um, as you all know, just to contextualize a little bit, that when I was appointed national director, I inherited an organization that was really in need of reform inspiration and innovation. And we've talked a lot about this. There was a staff survey that was conducted in 2019 that clearly gave us a mandate for change. And so the NPA was and is and was and still is full of really a lot of committed, hardworking staff members. But the organization that, that we inherited was really a battered one. And having been traumatized for many years, the impact on the MPA and the criminal justice system was quite devastating to say the least. But in this time together, we are methodically rebuilding the MPA so that we can once again put this commitment and expertise of staff members into action to deliver justice for the people of South Africa. Rebuilding was never going to be easy and it was never going to be quick. But it's important that South Africans know and understand this reality so that people do not lose hope in the rule of law. That said, I must admit that law enforcement and the NPA, we really need to do a lot more. People in South Africa do not feel safe and they do not believe that justice is being delivered swiftly or broadly enough. But please be assured that there is a lot of good things happening. We are making important progress and we hope to demonstrate that together. Um, as you know, we, we don't try cases in the media. So when it comes to cases, I hope you'll understand that we will not give details on matters, but we will try to give frank, uh, have a frank conversation about many critical issues, including the recent developments re relating to the um, vacation uh, of office of the head of the investigating directorate. So as Bulawa said, we'll deal with this first. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to go through this quite quickly. Um, bearing in mind that this engagement is much broader than this particular issue, but given that it has received a lot of attention in the media, we will deal with this first. Um, colleagues, firstly, there's just a few important um, things I want to state and that, well, before I get to that, just to say that, you know, a lot of, there's been a lot of reporting in the media on this. Um, we've also been asked to come to the portfolio committee on Wednesday, and we will give more, um, 
um, information there. But let me make a few high-level points. And one is to be clear that the NPA is not in a crisis and that there is no widespread sabotage of the ID or any part of the NPA that is taking place. Um, we've come through a difficult period, that is so, and there are various internal processes that are looking at various aspects. Um, Advocate Cronier's resignation and Exco's decision to approve it is a culmination of various factors. And I'm not going to go into the details of this, um, but the incorrect narrative in the media that it is because of interpersonal relations with, between her and I, it really makes for dramatic reporting, but that is where it ends. The interests of the country is important to both Advocate Cronier and I. Our decisions are made in the interests of the country. It is important to note that in high pressure and high stakes environments, occasional tensions or occasional disagreements are normal. The ID was and remains under considerable pressure to perform. And it's my job as a national director to ensure that it delivers. And we will show that there, is, there has been significant progress in the ID. And I, an investigating director and the national director need to be fully aligned on the overall strategy of the directorate, on the prosecution strategy, the priorities and case specific strategies, and then act with razor sharp focus on these. We will never have all the resources that we need, but we need to be able to prioritize for impact. The second point is that leadership transitions are normal and often healthy. All our organizations have staff turnover. And our job is to ensure continuity of business towards the achievement of our goal. If we are not focused on that and we cannot do that, then we are in a crisis. This is not the case. Advocate Cronier was appointed in May 2019. That's two years and eight months ago. It's a tough job in a tough environment. So it should not be a surprise or a concern that after this period, she has decided to move on. And the NPA, Exco, and myself have supported this. This is a kind of leadership transition that is normal. It is not a sign of crisis or collapse. It's in fact good when leaders take an organization as far as they can and then leave to a new leader to take forward with new energy, picking up on the good work that has already been done. Advocate Cronier has played her part. She's helped lay the foundation for the ID. And as she mentioned in the portfolio committee, the ID is now well placed for the next chapter. Advocate Cronier has indicated that there are many cases that are ready to be enrolled and every effort will be made to ensure that this happens as soon as possible. And I'm certainly hoping that we will see some movement in key cases before Advocate Cronier vacates her office. Um, the next point is that it takes time to establish a new entity within any organization, especially within government. Most businesses and organizational design experts will agree that it takes at least three years for an organization or department to break even. Structures, staffing, policies, and processes all need to be developed and put in place. And that's what we've done in the ID in less than three years. The Government Technical Advisory Center, known as GTAC, which is an agency of National Treasury, which builds public sector capacity to improve governance and public service delivery, has worked very closely with Advocate Cronier and the ID team for about two years. So it should not be surprising or concerning that it has taken just over two and a half years to get to this point. The next point I'd like to make is that we have prioritized the operational capacity of the ID. In just over 2.5 years, the ID has an established structure of over 120 staff, comprising of four specialized clusters and two admin or management units. The ID recently moved it into its own secure building with state-of-the-art facilities, and we are really looking forward to the next chapter, moving from this really good foundation that has been built with the leadership of Advocate Cronier. Um, the next point I'd like to make is that the NPA, in as much as capacity is an issue, I want to clarify that the NPA has the capacity to, pursue, to prosecute certain corruption cases, 
and complex crime matters and other high level crimes. However, the extent and nature of state capture corruption does require additional specialized skills and capacities. And so it's really important that we continue with our efforts to ensure that this, these capacities are obtained for the ID and the broader NPA as well. The ID is working closely with other parts of the NPA. The organization is working closely with the asset forfeiture unit to fast track cases, uh, to initiate asset forfeiture proceedings and recovery of stolen money from all jurisdictions. And I agree here, here as well that there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot more work to be done. And Advocate uh, Rasita, Rabaji Rasatava can actually um, add to that and if there are any questions in this regard later. Um, the ID additionally has roped in other stakeholders working with SARS Financial Intelligence Center, um, as well as um, the FIC, sorry, the Financial Intelligence Center and SARS, uh, in order to make sure that practically we can, we can come together and try to utilize the limited resources available in a more impactful way. The ID has additionally began the process of onboarding resources from the State Capture Commission in order to manage the process of when the report is handed down to the commission. There are, in the past two years that the ID has been around, the unit has managed to enroll about 18 cases, 70% being criminal cases that are still being ventilated in court, while the balance relates to asset forfeiture, um, civil recovery matters. With regard to the state-owned entities, um, the ID has also been dealing with the ESCOM matter, but focusing on the Kusila power station as one of its legs, and it has managed to obtain and confirm a 1.4 billion restraint order in that respect. The ID, as I said, is work, has worked with the asset forfeiture unit and obtained an unlimited restraint order against the assets of the Gupta family through the com company Island Site. Um, and as well as the recent case of Nulana Investment, which I understand is in court tomorrow. The way forward. Firstly, as I said when I started, there is no leadership gap. The NPA leadership will ensure continuity together with Advocate Cronier in the next three months and stability in the ID. A detailed transition plan will include interim management and oversight arrangements to ensure that the ID delivers on its mandate. The process to appoint a new investigating director will be rigorous in order to ensure that the right person is appointed with the right skills who will deliver. Deputy NDPP Advocate Rabaji Rasitaba will support Advocate Cronier in this transition period, during which time the new head will also be recruited. After a very challenging first startup phase, Advocate Cronier will leave the ID well positioned to deliver on its important mandate. I'm confident that given all the groundwork that has been done, that work will continue unaffected in the coming months. The stakes are high and we cannot afford to fail. We are ready with dedicated and committed staff in the ID and also in the broader NPA, firmly fixed on our goal to continue soldiering on towards that goal. Failure is not an option. In as much as Advocate Cronier will still be with us in the, um, in the transition phase, I do want to thank her for all her hard work, commitment and sacrifices that she has made up in positioning the ID to bring justice to those most responsible for corruption and state capture in our country. I have no doubt that she will continue the fight against impunity for corruption. Although we, have, we still have important work to do in this transition phase, and the president's decision is awaited, on behalf of the leadership of the NPA, I wish Adv Advocate Cronier every success in her career moving forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, National Director. Colleagues, now we will take questions on the issue around the ID and the resignation as the National Director has just addressed the issue. Um, I will take questions in groups of three so that um, we try and, and, and really expedite the, this process because um, 
we actually have a lot of you in, 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 the, in the session. And so we will need to manage our time very, very well. Um, maybe my colleagues from GCIS will also help me to um, see who's actually got their hand. Okay, I see the names. So I'll take them in this order. Kyle, Cowen will you be the first one, followed by Karen Moon, and then followed by um, Peter Detroit. So let's take those three for the first round. Good morning, am I audible? Yes, we can hear you, Kyle. Go ahead. Um, good morning, thank you, Kyle Cowan from News24. Uh, NDPP Advocate Patoy, you, you say that relationship between yourself and Advocate Karenia was not strained. However, in your, in your opening comments now, you did mention that there needs to be a, a high degree of alignment in terms of strategy and focus on specific cases and also prosecution strategy on, on specific cases. And then you said that these visions and strategies need to be executed with razor sharp focus. Um, are you implying that the focus was not strong from, from Advocate Kernier? Are you implying that the visions were not aligned and the strategies were not aligned? Uh, I think this speaks quite a lot to whether or not, you know, as you mentioned, these, these isolated incidents of, of, of tension between you two was, was more than that. And, and I think this is what we're really trying to understand. Was it isolated or was it continuous? Thank you. Karen, you're the next one. Hi. Um, I would just like to follow up my colleague's question with, um, you know, obviously having said all of that, uh, much may be read into the fact that Advocate Cronier is actually not at this press briefing. Um, can you give us any insight into to why, um, given the messaging that you've um, given about a sort of positive outlook and um, a lack of personality issues, she may have chosen not to attend. And then um, do you believe that Advocate Cronier genuinely wanted to leave uh, the NPA? Or, as has been speculated, was this simply the consequence of a great deal of frustration uh, with the dysfunctionalities that currently exist within the organization? Um, and you said in your response to some of uh, the questions that News24 put that this had been a subject of discussion for a few months. Uh, was there any effort by you or the NPA to persuade Advocate Cronier to stay? given that, you know, we know that people leadership move leaving, um, though you have stated very categorically that it can be a healthy thing, um, especially with the, you know, with the Estina cases, with so many cases yet to be launched, um, might actually be something that is potentially adverse to the ID's work. There we go. Advocate Dutoy, Peter Dutoy from News24 as well. Uh, in your mind, what has been the ID's biggest successes over the last two years? Um, and where did they come short uh, in your mind? Uh, the biggest successes and uh, where did they come short? Thank you. Thank you very much. That's the first three questions, uh, National Director. You've got them. Thank you very much um, for those questions. Um, on the first question, um, I think I can answer it by saying that um, we were actually moving towards that process of having the alignment with strategies. So that was actually work in progress. Um, and I think that you know the, the ID was actually beginning to prioritize better, realizing that we cannot, we cannot do everything. So if you do not have clear priorities and you're very, very focused on what we do, uh, it's going to be difficult. So I'd say that we were actually getting to that point. We've been working on aligning and making sure that we are both on the same page with regard to those issues. So that was work in progress. Um, this is, this is um, an engagement with the media, with the executive committee uh, of the NPA, which is why I think Cronier is not here. Um, Edward Cronier had expressed an intention to leave. I did initially 
um, in the initial period, try speak to Advocate Premier and in fact, try to, to ask her to remain. That was in the earlier phases, but they got to a point when I realized it would be in the interest of all concerned that Advocate Cronier does leave, and that is why I agreed to her vacation of office. Um, and I'm going to ask Advocate uh, Rabaji to deal with what the last question of Peter de Toy. Omar, are you ready? Uh, thank you very much for that question, Peter. Um, so your question is, what was the biggest successes? Um, the ID has um, really gone some way ensuring that there's capacity and capability in, in the ID. And um, this has resulted in, as I've said, uh, internal capacity and the NDPP has alluded to that. We've got over 100 permanent staff. Uh, we've got the sector leaders, which are the leaders that are looking at uh, three areas of focus um, as far as handling state capture cases and um, good stakeholder relationships. As you know, um, the ID had to be... Um, started with getting secondments from all the other law enforcement agencies. So we've got good relationships with um, DPCI, the Hawks. Uh, we've got, they've seconded um, their most experienced and skilled staff um, to the ID as well as um, IPID, SARS, and all the other law enforcement agencies. And of course, as far as the cases that they've initiated, of the 17 cases, um, we've got some of um, cases that that has been highlighted by 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 the by the national director, um, the ESCOM case pertaining to Shakuji Meta, the 1.4 billion asset for future order, the unrestrained order as far as the Nulani Meta uh, is concerned, which is over 500 million, and um, we have really um, started making impact as far as fight, fighting corruption is concerned. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Um, we go to the next round. I think, yeah, and, and I think before we go on to the next round, there was a I think Peter de Toys was the biggest shortcoming as well as the successes. Um, I think perhaps one of the biggest shortcomings is trying to do too much, um, you know, without all of the resources that we need. And I think that has probably been one of the biggest shortcomings is that we really need to hone in on, on very specific issues and cases and try to make impact because otherwise it's, it's really impossible to deal with with um, you know what is what is on our plates, and you know, yeah, moving forward, there's going to be an avalanche of work coming from the Zondo Commission as well. So we really need to enhance that ability to be very strategic and focused in terms of what we select. And there will also be an expectation then that there will be quick successes. And I really want to temper expectations in that regard to say that you know that there's a big difference between testifying in a commission and putting together a watertight case. And so those, they will be, it will take time to go through that and to make sure that we're very strategic about what the cases are that we take uh, emanating from, from the Zondo Commission and that we have the, the necessary resources to deal with them. Okay, that's responses to the first round. We proceed to the next group of three, which is um, firstly, somebody from UFM News Note. Um, it doesn't have a name. And then Sipo Masondo and Mandy Winner. In that order, please. Sorry, um, before, before you start responding, Erin Bates actually was um, also had her question in the previous round, but it was in written form. 
So Erin, if you can maybe um, also join this group uh, in, 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 in asking a question. Who's from UFM? Okay, maybe let's move on to Sipo Masondo, Mandy Wiener, and then uh, Erin Bates, please. Colleagues, we cannot hear you. Who's, who's asking the question now? Okay, Sipo okay. seems to be struggling with something. I see Kyle. So, Mandy, can you come in? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Fabulous. Thank you. It's Maddie Wiener from 702. Um, Advocate Patoy, there seems to be an issue amongst the, the public and advocacy groups around patience. Um, and this is a very relative term that people are, are becoming impatient with the apparent lack of progress. How much patience is enough? And do you think it's fair for people to say, or activist uh, groups or the journalists to say that there has not been progress? How do we measure progress? Thank you, Mandy. Sipo, are you able to come in? Masondo? Okay, Sipo okay. is still struggling. Erin um, Bates, please come through. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. So my first question, um, Advocate Patoy, is when did the ID move into its new premises? You mentioned them earlier. Secondly, has the process to appoint a new head already begun? If so, what are those details? Then what are the latest details you can share about either staff or material from the state capture inquiry being handed over to the NPA and the ID? And have there been engagements on the anticipated report? Then you've spoken about an unrestrained 500 billion rand order in relation to Nulane. But the current matter, as far as I know in the Free State, concerns a 25 million rand feasibility report. So is that narrow case to you satisfactory when it comes to litigating from the ID side in relation to the Guptas? And then uh, my last question is whether Advocate Krenier has given you any indication she is going straight into a new post or is she leaving without something else lined up at this point? Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Sipo, are you still struggling or shall we move on to the next person? Sipo, still struggling. UFM, somebody from UFM. Um, Jan De Lange, please go ahead with your question. Can you hear me? Our colleagues. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Jan. Go ahead. <coughs> I'd like to know from a but way, are there any staffs, any senior staffs in, in the National Prosecuting Authority left who was implicated in state capture or crimes of any other nature? And if so, why are they still there? And secondly, <coughs> uh, a specific matter, the the, the state capture or corruption or embezzlement of money by the Department of uh, Health in Gaucheng uh, of, I think, 1.2 billion, which was most of it was recovered, but not a single prosecution followed from it, as far as I know. Uh, yet uh, it was followed up last year with another scandal with, with PPEs. Uh, and, and in August this year, it came to light that a whistleblower and an important and an important management position, financial uh, overseer, officer, 
was was murdered in, in, a, in an apparent hit murder. Wasn't that very disconcerting? Can you can you can you talk about that? The effect of that of 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 such uh, uh, grabbing of state captures of state resources with no consequences in a criminal sense. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. That's the group of questions in DPP for this round. Sorry, sorry, I think. Okay, sorry, I was I was on mute. Uh, but responding to Mandy, Mandy Wiener's question, I can fully understand the impatience of the people of South Africa in terms of the apparent slow movement with regard to prosecutions. But when we when we when we think about what is reasonable and what should be expected, particularly in the context of the ID, we have to remember where the ID started. It started at zero. There was absolutely nothing. And we still have a long way to go. We're not anywhere near where we want to be. But where we are at now, clearly the age of impunity is over. There is no guaranteed impunity anymore. And that is really important that even though the wheels of justice are turning slowly, they are turning and people cannot act with brazen impunity anymore. If you look at the ID, as I said, it started off at zero. And now we've reached a point where the, there's, it's, it's not fully capacitated. As I say, we will never have all the resources and we do need very specialized skills that I was talking about. And we are putting every effort into doing that in a very complicated government procurement process as well. So all of those things are coming together. And so I really think that, as Advocate Pronier said in Parliament as well, that in as much as the ID doesn't have everything, it is well poised now to deliver on some, some key cases. And I'm certainly hoping that even before Advocate Pronier leaves, that there will be some movement in significant cases, or at least in the next six months. But in the broader context, remember the ID is only dealing with a very, very small percentage of, of cases. And we work very closely in the context of the Specialized Commercial Crime Units together with the DPCI to deal with a whole lot of other corruption, high-level complex corruption matters. And in that space, um, the head of the DPCI, General Labia, has said publicly even that they are really struggling with capacities and capabilities. And so this really has to be addressed as a matter of extreme urgency. Otherwise, we are going to be dealing with cases and we will make impact, but it's not going to happen as fast as the public and as we would like to, to actually see uh, cases moving to court. Um, with regard to the, the issue of... of I th uh, with regard to the moving to the new premises, I'm going to ask Advocate Duplessis, um, the head of the Strategy Operations and Compliance section in the NPA, to deal with that. But let me he'll, he'll come to that. Let me deal with the with the other matters. And with regard to, um, I, I don't I don't know whether Advocate Pronier has anything lined up. Um, with regard to the um, the Nulani matter, I'll ask Advocate Rabaji uh, Rastaba. Uh, to take that one with regard to senior staff that have been implicated. Look, the, the Zondo, in the Zondo Commission, the names of various uh, members of staff in the NPA uh, was mentioned. And all I can say at this stage is that they are internal processes. Um, as you all know, Advocate Noko um, left the organization in the face of possible um, fitness to hold office inquiry. Um, but they are internal processes, and I do not want to, we don't discuss that, discuss that in the media as a matter of um, policy. But these are complicated issues because we're dealing with a whole range of staff members and very complex issues. But rest assured, there are processes 
that are ongoing in the organization to address this matter. Um, Anton, can you go first? Okay. Uh, yes, good morning. Uh, good morning, colleagues. Thank you very much. I think it's Aaron for that question on the building. So the ID has moved into a new building uh, in September. It is a state-of-the-art building which has all the facilities needed for the kind of um, unit that the ID is and the expansion plans over the coming uh, months and years. Uh, the process did take a little bit longer because it was a complicated procurement process for a, um, for a very specific building, uh, but we're very pleased with the, uh, with the facility that is available now. And uh, there's a lot of work going into uh, making it fit for purpose uh, for, for, for the long-term future of the ID. I think that also speaks to the question that was raised about the, um, the Zondo resources, and I'll just touch on that briefly. Of course, it's been a bit, little bit complicated with the stop-start nature of the Zondo uh, Commission. Uh, we're not, we, we haven't been aware of exactly when it would end and just when we were prepared for the transition uh, of the resources over to the IID, um, further extensions were granted. We now know that the process of extensions is over and that the report will be handed to the President on the 1st of January. So we are really planning full speed ahead for that transition and that includes not just the capacity of staff, and there are a number of them, uh, investigators and, uh, and uh, analysts and lawyers that are moving across from the Zondo uh, Commission, but also the, the uh, transfer of the Digital Forensic Lab, which is a really huge um, uh, asset that will be coming across to the NPA and to the ID uh, as soon as Zondo wraps up. I think it's also an important point to make in relation to the Zondo transition uh, that we are dealing with two different uh, outcomes. The Zondo uh, commission, of course, being a truth commission, uh, the NPA and the ID being a, a, a criminal prosecution process uh, with different outcomes. So the um, it is quite difficult to to overlap the work, and I think that's something that has to be borne in mind. But of course, as we head into January uh, with the transition of the uh, resource, I think the NDPP has already referred to the importance of us being prepared for what she referred to as an avalanche of cases that come from Zondo. But we we don't want to preempt that. Um, but we are getting ready for it, both in terms of capacity and in terms of infrastructure. So I think on that question, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Um, and then to respond on the question whether uh, the 25 million restraint order uh, that started off um, with the feasibility study restraint is good enough to um, initiate and and good enough to litigate with the Guptas? The answer is yes, um, because um, currently where we stand, um, you'll recall that the unlimited restraint order uh, is against the assets of the Gupta family through the company Eyeless Line. And uh, where we stand now is that We've got the following assets. So this is going to keep on growing. We've got the restraint order of 44 million in immovable property and an aircraft valued at 3 million US dollars. If you convert that into rents, it's um, 47 million. Uh, and this, this belongs to Alice Light Investments, p Limited, as well as... Um, 60 million uh, property that belongs to Iqbal Shama and his wife. So, yes, this is good enough to continue the litigation with the Guptas, particularly on the recovery of the, the stolen assets. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll perhaps just add to, to what uh, Advocate Baji just said and to say that, um, you know, it, it is the capacitation of the asset forfeiture unit is a huge priority for the organization as well, because the in order to address uh, corruption, there's, it's, this, it's a two-pronged. One is the prosecutions and holding people accountable, and the other aspect is bringing back the money. And yes, given the, the huge amount of public funds that have been stolen, the, the current restraints that we have may seem quite um, small, and they are. That, that is the reality. But it shows that there is... Um, these and the financial investigations in these matters are very complex and they also take a lot of time. But under the leadership, the very, very capable 
uh, leadership of Advocate Rabaji, the Asset Forfeiture Unit is looking at various strategies, both internally working with a whole range of partners, even international partners, um, to make sure that we are able to really make impact with regard to recovery of stolen uh, funds from South Africa. Thank you, National Director. And um, media colleagues, um, at this point, I think it will be important for us to move on. The, the, the questions that have come through in writing that relate to the ID, because remember we said this first um, session, we will um, focus on ID questions. The other questions may well be addressed after the NDPP's uh, full briefing. Um, Sipoma Sondo came through because he couldn't, he couldn't speak. His question is, has the ID successfully prosecuted any case since it was established? And that, that is the only other question that, that relates to the ID. Then we can move on, National Director. I can say that, you know, what is a successful prosecution? A successful prosecution is charging people and then taking a case to conclusion. Um, and so there's no cases that have been concluded yet. But these, these matters um, are really complicated. And, and the sad reality in, our, uh, in, in the current climate is that accused persons will do everything possible, the so-called Stalingrad tactics, to ensure that cases do not proceed to finality, that the state is not able to even start um, leading the evidence on the merits of the case. But we are acutely aware of this strategy, and we are in the NPA looking at um, we've developed guidelines. We're looking at really empowering prosecutors to resist these attempts. But at the end of the day, there are decisions that are made by judges and magistrates. And so, you know, and, and there's, you know, that's, there's nothing we can do about that. But what we can do is certainly have a very, very strong um, strategy to be able to deal with these tactics and argue against cases being inordinately delayed. Um, before they are finalized. Thank you, National Director. You know, on, on that note, um, we continue with the rest of the information the National Director wants to share. Over thank, to you. And thank you very much, Kulalwa. Um, so members of the media, looking at the, at the, at, at the broader work of the NPA, which is really an, an very, very important institution in our constitutional democracy. Um, we prioritized the following. Firstly, we really looked at improving our internal processes, policies, and, and getting to develop a fit for purpose organization that is able to meet the demands of the 21st century. And so we, the support to the core was extremely important. And so we, what we did is we've repositioned our, what was the old admin and support functions under a new DNDPP for strategy operations and compliance. And they are looking to see how they can support the core so that we can deliver effectively and innovatively as possible. But this is not just about optics. We have positioned the SOC, as it is known, to be a strategic partner to the core business of the NPA by inter alia critically reviewing a whole lot of policies, et cetera, in order to make sure that we enhance efficiency as well as our response times. Um, we've developed an extensive capacity development program for the NPA, looking at basic training right from the aspirants, but also looking at advanced specialized training in a whole range of areas. They ha COVID has affected our plans in this regard, but we're certainly hoping that we would be able to, to ramp up efforts in those, in those areas. We're also looking at a mentorship program and also utilizing um, the old, um, uh, I shouldn't say old, the experienced and retiring prosecutors um, to be able to mentor staff members. And I just realized that I didn't deal with one question by one colleague dealing to the whistleblower and PPA, but I'll, I'll deal with that as we proceed with this engagement. Um, we're also looking um, in, in a partnership with UCT and Oxford University to have an advanced man management and leadership training for our senior managers. We are driving modernization using trying to use digital tech more effectively within the NPA. 
we have really injected innovation into the heart of the NPA. We realize that without innovation, we are never going to be able to deal with the intractable problems that have been, um, that have actually um, in within the NPA and within the broader criminal justice system. And so we've established an innovation and policy support office focusing on more longer term strategic issues, trends and challenges facing the NPA and to serve as an innovation hub um, within the NPA. Collaboration, we've really focused on collaboration. Success isn't possible without really strong, constructive collaboration, both internal and external. So we're really focusing on stakeholder engagements, various stakeholders within government, outside of government, including the business sector and civil society. We had hoped to have a civil society roundtable again this year, but COVID has really played havoc with us, but we're hoping um, that in the new year, we would be able to, to uh, have another civil society roundtable, acknowledging the important role that civil society plays. Um, we are repositioning the NPA to make an effective contribution to the country's social economic development, restoring faith in the rule of law and public trust in our institutions. With regard to the, to the substantive units um, in the NPA, we want, beyond the investigating director, as I alluded to, um, the NPA's rebuilding capacities and capabilities in the Specialized Commercial Crime Unit um, and also in the Asset Forfeiture Unit, because this is also at the forefront of our fight against corruption. Um, Beyond our, our key partner in the SAPS, and the, including the DPCI, we are working also with the Financial Intelligence Center and the Special Investigating Unit and the South African Revenue Service to make sure that we are able to tackle corruption from all angles. Um, we are strengthening prosecutorial accountability through a rather ambitious community prosecutions initiative. In selective areas, the NPA will build capacity in order to work strategically with our community partners, um, with partners in the community and the community itself in order to find sustainable long-time solutions to crime. Um, we're also looking to, together with our key partner, SAPS, to be more strategic in terms of how we deal with crime and to look at prioritizing investigation and prosecutions of certain crimes that generate particular fear amongst South Africans, for example, housebreaking and house robberies. Um, we also have had extensive, we all, sexual and gender-based crimes and violence is also an important priority for the, uh, for the NPA. And we've been working very closely with our colleagues in the, um, in the SAPS. And I will give you some more detail on this. We've been particularly also involved in the DNA project because there was a huge backlog with regard to DNA um, test sample results. And I will give you some figures on that in due course. There has been substantial progress, but we're still nowhere near dealing with the scourge of sexual and gender-based violence in our country. And the reality is that law enforcement is not going to be able to deal with this matter. We really need an all of a whole of society approach so that we deal with why these offenses are being committed. We have really good conviction rates, but that's only with regard to cases that come to the courts. Otherwise, if you look at the conviction rates vis-a-vis -vis the number of reported cases, it's really quite low. Um, what to expect in the future? Um, Filling of key leadership positions, particularly at DPP and special director level, is crucial to ensure stability and professional leadership in the regions and also within the specialized units. Um, we talked about the Zondo Commission recommendations. Um, so I, I just want to add to that to say that ho hopefully it will give us impetus to actually deal with the prosecu prosecution of persons involved in state capture, but also to boost the NPA's independence drive, which is critical. We established, we are in the process of establishing the NPA Office of Ethics and Accountability, and we can talk more about that, and, but that is really to ensure that there is a zero tolerance in the NPA to improper conduct or unethical conduct. Um, we're de developing um, 
the NPA policy on non-trial resolutions. And this is really important in terms of um, guiding possible negotiated set settlements as we proceed with very, very complex and international um, corruption cases and looking at and possible agreements with, with companies, but still ensuring that we prosecute persons that are implicated. Um, we have, corruption has always been a top priority for the NPA, but during a recent um, workshop that we had, um, this was one of several priorities, but it was being, it was being, uh, it was receiving specialist attention, but we decided that work will continue in the other areas, but corruption is going to be the only area, it's going to be the prioritized area in the NPA. And this is going to cover the work of the ID, the SCCU, that's Specialized Commercial Crimes Unit, and the S Asset Forfeiture Unit. Um, we identified four elements to this. And one is we have to have enhanced internal and external collaborations. We've got to really improve that. Um, we've got to increase the impact of asset recovery. So there's going to be a strong focus on that. The skills enhancement that I talked about and improve communications around corruption cases. Members of the media, corruption, addressing corruption is not a sprint, it is a marathon, but at least we are on the right track. Despite impo important progress, as I said when I started off, we are far from where we want to be, but we are on this journey. And what is clear, as I also mentioned, is that impunity is no longer a given. The taps of corruption and rent seeking are being closed, and that's the reality. And there are important cases which my colleagues, which you've been reporting on for the past year that have been brought to court that demonstrate this. It demonstrates that the rule of law in our country is our guiding light. We must also look at prioritizing and perhaps the less serious cases and getting them to court whilst we are looking at the long-term more complicated charges, which take time. And this is all about our prosecution strategies. Um, we are also looking at, um, you know, our efforts have been bolstered by the specialized commercial crime courts and also the creation of corruption courts, um, also the creation of national and sectoral anti-corruption hotlines. Um, with regard to, to the divisions and just prioritization on corruption matters, um, each division has selected cases that they are prioritizing and they are monitoring the, the progress with regard to these matters. As I said, we can't do all the cases. We have to prioritize for impact. impact. This intervention has ensured that with regard to government corruption, um, it improved from 31 convictions last year to 53 conv convictions at the end of Q2 this year. And private sector corruption cases increased from 68 to 84. There are various other aspects to the work of the NPA. Organized crime is critical, and these groups have not been deterred during COVID-19. They've become more techno-savvy in how to communicate and plan. And although there are, there are pockets and there's a smattering of organized crime cases that are coming through, and you know, perhaps an, a good example of that is addressing gang violence in the Western Cape with significant arrests and prosecutions that are proceeding. The reality is that without good crime intelligence and properly identified project-driven investigations, we will lose the fight against organized crime. So there really needs to be a lot of work that goes into making sure that the true organized criminals are brought to court and not the runners on the ground. There are many areas that we need to focus on together with our, of course, I mean, we can only do it with our colleagues in the SAPs. Some of the areas are cable theft, damage to essential infrastructure and illicit mining. So it's really important that law enforcement is able to capacitate itself with the necessary expertise including cyber experts, in order to deal with all of these organized crime challenges that face our country, including illicit com commodity export markets. And as I said, to get the real syndicate leaders in, with regard to the various 
organized crime types. Um, on the issue of TRC cases, um, again, in, in this particular area, we recognize and, and appreciate that these cases have taken a long time to come to, um, well, there are a few cases that have come to court, but these cases have taken a really long time to be addressed. And there are various reasons for this. But in order to expedite process in this matter, we have actually, um, from September this year, we set up a new portfolio in the NPS, that's the National Prosecuting Service of the NPA, in order to deal specifically with matters that emanate from the TRC. And this is headed by Deputy National Director Advocate de Kock. The NPA recognizes the historical importance of thorough and proper investigation of matters and the need for dedicated prosecutors to deal with these cases. And what we've done is we've managed to get a deviation from the Department of Public Service Administration in order to hire prosecutors on contract for a period of three years who are dealing exclusively with TRC matters in the various regions. And we also, the DPCI, we are working very closely with them. And General Lebeer of the DPCA has, um, has been capacitating the DPCI in the regions to work closely with these prosecutors to make sure that we are able to bring these cases to court. Uh, so we've put in place structures to do this. Um, we are looking at ensuring that there, we have quality investigations. We are also looking at training for investigators. So far, a total of 59 cases are under investigation with 56 new matters to be referred. We do recognize, as I've said before, that time is running out. And really, the NPA, as part of law enforcement, has a duty to assist families to ensure that matters that are referred to are decided upon and that there is justice for the families of atrocities that were committed during the apartheid era. Um, I said I'd give some, some figures on sexual and gender-based violence just to get back quickly to that. Uh, the conviction rate of sexual offenses at the end of Q2, as I said, was, was high, it's almost 73% with 815 convictions with really high sentences that are being involved. Life, se life sentences, um, 20, 25 years. But as I said, the reality is that this is not going to deal with the scourge of sexual and gender-based violence. Um, a total of almost 16,000 victims received services at 55 Tutuzela care center sites um, for the year-to-date performance at the end of Q2. I talked about the DNA prioritization team, and I can give you some figures on that. Um, until the 12th of November 2021, uh, we received a further 1,786 reports that were submitted to the NPA head office and distributed to the regions. Um, and we are the total, this brings the total number of reports received as, as a result of this project that I mentioned to 4,529. That is quite a significant amount when one considers the backlogs that we were dealing with. Um, there are 55 Tutuzela care sites. There are two more that are providing services, but they're not yet in, in operation in line with the Tutuzela care center model. And we are looking to make sure that that happens. Um, there is also a hashtag Know Your Tutuzela Awareness campaign um, at the moment. Members of the media, in conclusion, I'd like to just make the, the following remarks. We are acutely aware, as I said when I started off, of the importance of the media in so many respects with regard to keeping the people of South Africa informed. Importantly, the impact of investigative journalism we remain supportive of the importance of independent and responsible reporting in matters of national interest. That said, we have noted with concern concerted efforts of report that amounts to trial by the media, where we are asked for comment on issues relating to, for example, witnesses and evidence. We remain firm that we will not ventilate issues that are justiciable before the courts in the media as they will likely compromise our prosecution and seriously undermine the rule of law and the fair administration of justice. We appeal to the media to allow pending cases to be tried in a competent court of law rather than in the media, 
which could, as I said, compromise um, cases and where accused persons could raise issues relating to fairness, etc. So as the NPA, we will not get involved in trial in the media. We're also aware that particularly when it comes to prosecuting high profile accused uh, or politically exposed persons, that we will receive attacks from all quarters. This is a distraction mechanism to divert attention away from the actual evidence and the court proceedings and to play, and to play the case out in the public domain. We will not engage or get involved in this. These attacks in the media continue against our office um, quite frequently. And, and the pattern is it's often when these cases, it's prior to um, or, or subsequent to a court appearance. Attacks against the NPA are fine as long as they are based on fact and they are justified. The NPA needs to be held accountable. We are accountable. But unjustified, baseless attacks undermine important institutions and could damage trust in these important institutions. So again, I really plead for responsible reporting, particularly with regard to cases. As I said, we will not subject ourselves to trial in the media. The evidence will speak for itself and we will be not drawn into the public spat by high profile uh, accused persons. As the prosecutors, we focus on the evidence and we will follow the evidence with regard to prosecutorial decisions that are made. Thank you very much, members of the media. Um, that is my address. Thank you, National Director. Um, media colleagues, it's time for questions. Before I call you out, I will read the questions. Sipo Masondo was struggling to, to, to come through, but also his questions were not particularly related to the ID. So Sipo's question is, the NPA is quite good with the prosecution of cases like murder and robbery, but it doesn't look like prosecutors are able to deal with complex financial crimes. Other than VBS and Steinhoff, are there any other serious financial crimes that the NPA is dealing with? If yes, kindly name at least three. Uh, and it continues, has the NPA successfully prosecuted a high profile financial crime in the last five years? And does the NPA actually have the capacity to prosecute high profile financial crimes? So that's, that's um, one set from Sipoma Sondo. Uh, I will, I, okay. Karen Mon and Jan de Lange, in that order. Hi, can you hear me? Hello? I'm not sure if you can hear me or not. Karen, please go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, my question uh, first is in relation to the TRC cases. We know that the family of the Craddock Four launched litigation to try and compel the NPA to make a decision. Um, I spoke to the lawyer for the family members, and they, you had apparently, according to him, given an undertaking that you would make a decision in relation to that case on the 2nd of December. Um, it appears that you missed that deadline. Um, given what you've said about the need of foreclosure for these families and the fact that the families are now saying they will be forced to litigate over the NPA's failure to make a decision, um, you know, how do you, can you please take us into your confidence as to why you have not met that deadline, um, particularly given the kind of hurt and pain outlined by those families um, in pursuing these cases? Um, there appears to be a very disturbing amount of evidence that has been outlined by the SCA about deliberate um, prevention of prosecution of TRC matters uh, being furthered, Lucy Piccoli, amongst other people, giving evidence. Um, would you support the inquiry that you've been ordered to hold 
um, by the SCA being a public one where multiple people can come and testify and seek answers about why those cases were not pursued. Um, secondly, there has been increasing public calls given your clear capacity issues, which are evident from the fact that we haven't seen high profile, sophisticated commercial crimes cases actually being tried and resulting in conviction, that the NPA maybe needs to turn around and, and nolly those cases, um, nolly Prasa, nolly some of the ESCOM cases, um, essentially just say, look, we don't have capacity and put it into the hands of uh, private prosecution. We know that this is already happening but um, handed over to NGOs, uh, organizations that have shown that they can collate and, and produce evidence to take matters to court and instead pursue private prosecutions. Because um, at this point, you know, there is, while, you know, your, 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 your plans are admirable, I think that what South Africans are craving more than anything is, is some form of accountability. Um, in whichever mechanism they may find them. And, and given that you've spoken so much about collaboration, finding different solutions to prosecutions, is that not an option that you should be looking at? Um, really empowering prosecutions to take, for instance, pass away the work was done by Vaxman so, so, category, you know, so deeply, would, the, would they not be better placed to take that case on? Thank you. Thank you. Jan, you ready? Jan Delang. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, Hello. we can hear you. <clears throat> Just want to remind you, I think you, you wanted to answer my question in the previous round about the the, the whistleblower and the effect that might, it might have on, on, on issues. And also in the previous round, I asked you about, I never wanted you to talk about uh, disciplinary, in, internal disciplinary processes, but I was hoping you could maybe give us an indication of how many people in the NPA who were involved or were implicated in state capture are, the, are they still there and, and how many disciplinary cases maybe, an indication of how many people they are involved in this. Thank you. Okay, um, I don't see any other questions at the moment. Andy, okay, so let me take those. Um, um, the issue of dealing with, with serious financial crimes, I'll deal with it at a high level and then I'll ask Advocate Koch to come in with some of the details with regard to some of the cases that are coming through to court um, or that have been prosecuted as, as the question is framed. Um, and, and my other colleagues may want to come in on this as well. But I, we've, we've, I think you, you, you are right that the, the NPA has a lot of very, very highly skilled and, and committed prosecutors that can prosecute lots of you know, serious murders, rapes, robberies. And the, the idea was that in the specialized commercial crime unit space, which was the unit that was set up to deal with serious complex corruption. That's where the expertise would be developed in order to deal with these cases. Now we do have some prosecutors that can deal with this, but as I said, the particular complexity of matters of grand corruption requires certain specialized skills that we do not have in the NPA. And so the, the, capacitation and the development of skills is a top priority. And we're looking at various ways in which to ensure that we have, we are doing, we're in the process of doing a skills audit in this particular field to properly understand what the skills levels are. And then to make sure that all of those critical, highly specialized skills that are needed, that there's a, a proper training plan and that we do, um, you know, in, I'm, I'm hoping within six months or a year at least, have a group of highly skilled prosecutors with all these specialist skills to be able to do these cases. But that said, as I said, there are a number, there are prosecutors that can deal with this, but regret some prosecutors, but regrettably in the past, what, what I found when I took office is that the less serious cases were being dealt with in the specialized commercial crime unit space. And so there was a process to migrate a lot of those cases to the district courts or the regional courts outside of the specialized courts. 
and to ensure that those cases here are the complex commercial crime matters. And so Advocate de Kock might be able to take that a little further. Um, on the TRC cases, yes, the, the, the issue of the missing of the deadline, which was uh, um, my understanding, there was some kind of undertaking that was given by the um, management and prosecutors in the Eastern Cape. Um, I'm going to ask Advocate de Kock to give some details on that issue. Um, I would certainly support that any inquiry, and I have been engaging with the with the minister on this with regard to um, holding an inquiry into uh, possible interference in the work of the NPA with regard to bringing prosecutions uh, with regard to TRC matters. As you correctly said, uh, the Kohli has actually deposed to an affidavit, um, and that's in the public domain. So I would certainly support that the inquiry be public so that there's transparency, um, and that hopefully there's also, it helps with bringing justice and, and, and an understanding of what actually resulted in the delay with regard to a number of these matters. Um, the issue of um, private prosecutions, well, I'm just broadly calling it private prosecutions, but I think the, the NPA is the constitutionally mandated prosecuting authority. And what's important is to make sure that the NPA, as that mandated authority, has the resources to be able to deal with these cases and that we don't start outsourcing prosecutions. These cases need to be prosecuted without fear, favor or prejudice. We need to ensure that there is an independent investigation and that there aren't allegations that there are certain other agendas that are driving prosecutions. And therefore, it's critically important that the NPA gets the capacity, deals with these cases, and once they are properly investigated, if there is no case, if we cannot proceed with the case, then yes, then at that stage, we must issue a nolly prosecutory certificate. But we can't do that until we've reached a point where we are satisfied that the investigations have been completed. Um, with regard to the issue of, um, I think one of, the, one of the issues that's important in this regard as well is that the, the national, national anti-corruption strategy sets out a whole of government approach to dealing with corruption. And as you were, uh, recently there was an advert for the members of the advisory council to the president who's going to help who's going to advise the president on various aspects of the implementation of the national strategy, including um, the issue of the single entity. And I think that is critical because we need clear, we need clear direction from government in terms of what exactly is the single entity going to look like. And for now, I'm very confident that all the work that has gone into setting up the investigating directorate, although there have been challenges, but it is, um, it is positioned to be able to ensure that we are able to deal with these high level complex corruption matters. It's not yet there, but I think the foundation has been laid to, do, to deal with that. But the sooner we get clear direction from government on the single entity, I think the better it would be in terms of moving forward. Um, the issue of the whistleblower protection, which I'm also going to ask Advocate de Kock, who, who's leading the, um, the NPA on discussions uh, with the, in this regard, um, to add to what I have to say. But you're absolutely right. The, 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 the killing, the cold-blooded killing of possible witnesses or whistleblowers is is extremely, extremely concerning in this country. We do have a, a witness protection um, program, um, but that is for witnesses, not for whistleblowers. But we are looking at how we could try to ensure that, that genuine whistleblowers do get the necessary um, support and protection. Um, the DG in the Department of Justice is facilitating discussions on this. Now the minister is, is also involved um, at, so it's at a very high level that we are trying to, to look at what can be done to protect genuine whistleblowers 
and not those that, I mean, they, there are instances where you have suspects that claim to be whistleblowers, uh, potential suspects. So we've got to look at this very carefully. There's got to be a very clear uh, framework to deal with this. But in the meantime, whilst all of those processes are happening, we really got to look at how we can be innovative about protecting genuine whistleblowers right now. Uh, I'm going to ask um, colleagues, uh, Advocate de Kock, are you ready to take some of those questions? And then Advocate Tribaji. Thank you very much, uh, NDPP, and good morning uh, to all the colleagues. And thank you for the opportunity to talk about uh, our work. So just in relation to the issues around the complex commercial work, uh, the MPA has been doing complex commercial work for a number of years. Um, and there are a number of very good outcomes and convictions that have been sustained over the years. Uh, we, have an, we have received uh, prison sentences in respect of many uh, uh, accused persons in relation to complex uh, commercial crime. Uh, I think in the recent years, the one that pops to mind was a matter uh, that arose within the Western Cape of J. Arthur Brown. And, the, and you will recall uh, the attempts that the prosecution had to do to actually ensure that we went from a fine that was imposed in the High Court to 15 years direct imprisonment that was uh, ruled on in the Supreme Court of Appeal. So that speaks to the capability of the prosecution. And there's examples of types, those types of cases in all the respective divisions of the, of, the, of the country. So I wouldn't go in too many details around that, but I think that we must accept that we have the capability and the capacity. The question will be, how do we organize our resources to ensure that we're able to do deal with all the appropriate cases. So currently, within the in our specialized commercial crimes units, we have 224 prosecutors. Uh, of those 224 prosecutors, 92% of those prosecutors have experience of 10 years or more. Now, these are prosecutors who have been in courts every day of their lives. And we must commend the men and women who are at the forefront of doing the work in our courts. There is a lot of work. We accept that. And it's about how we organize the work to ensure that we are able to get that work processed through our court system. Now, as we know, and also taking into account the impact of COVID last year that had a dramatic impact on our ability to process cases through the courts. These colleagues must ensure that very complex matters are dealt with. And then of course, we have uh, lawyers who are able to uh, act in the interest of the clients as per the law, and who will then bring various applications um, during the course of a criminal trial. So all these factors impact on our ability to do the work. But I would like to reassure everyone that we do have the capability and the capacity to do the work. So what the MPA has decided now recently in its uh, strategic session that it has, we will assess all the cases of a high profile nature that we have. We will look at them, we will review them, and we will ensure that we've got the, the best capacity available in the respective divisions to do those matters. That's the first thing. We will also work very closely with the ID. So as the ID is um, uh, taking the work forward, the prosecution is going to support the work of the ID in relation to complex work. So one area that we are currently looking at is to look at the question of tax offences, and to utilize the specialized capability that the MPA has in relation to tax work. So currently, we have 88 posts for tax prosecutors within the MPA. And these are very senior people as well, who also do commercial work. And we've got very good tax convictions in our country. And they are going to work very closely with our ID colleagues and the ID prosecutors to ensure that where there are tax legs to these investigations that we are currently busy with, that those matters are, are expedited from a tax point of view. 
And then furthermore, we are going to work very closely with the, with the SARS investigators as well that we will bring in. So I think what I'm saying is that we are going to win this war collectively, not just with law enforcement, with the help of the whole of South Africa, the whole of society approach. And we are going to focus our work in a multi-agency manner to ensure that we bring all the strengths to the table. And so from a forensic, forensic accounting point of view, we will make sure that we have sufficient capability to do the forensic analysis. So a lot of work is happening in that regard to enhance the capacity of the state to do the forensic work required in these complex matters. We are working closely with the DPCI in terms of the investigations that they do. We are working closely with the Financial Intelligence Center. We are working closely with the South African Revenue Service. We are working closely with the Reserve Bank and with all banks and other institutions in the country. So I'm, I'm saying that we are poised to really take forward this fight in terms of dealing with complex commercial work. And the last point I wish to make is that just recently we established specialized commercial courts in all our provinces. That is a first. We never had that. We had four courts, Johannesburg, Cape Town, Pretoria, and then we, we, we included Durban, Eastern Cape, but not the other provinces. So that has been set up within the last year. These are things that we didn't have before. We've, we've developed the capacities in those areas. We are still putting capacities into those areas, and we are pointing dedicated tax prosecutors as well in those areas. And the last point I wish to make, we also have organized crime specialists within the NPA. Now, organized crime and commercial work and corruption are very closely linked. And so we're also going to use our organized crime capabilities to assist with this work. And so what I'm saying is we will find the expertise and we will appoint people to work with us. The last point is that we do work with the private sector. Those lawyers who want to work for the MPA are welcome to come. And from time to time, the MPA employs lawyers in terms of Section 38 of the MPA Act, and they are paid to work with the MPA. So where there's a deficiency of skills or capability, we readily acknowledge that. And on motivation from our directors of public prosecutions or from our investigating director, we will then seek the assistance of the private sector to assist the prosecution. And I think this is the model that we need to follow. The model should not be one of competition. The model should be one of working together in a collaborative way to deal with crime. We are not in a competition with anybody, but we welcome everybody to work with us to solve this very difficult challenge and to solve all the issues that we have in this period. I'm confident that we are going to achieve that. As far as the TRC uh, work is concerned, if I can just find my notes on that quickly. So as far as the TRC work is concerned, I think for the first time, the prosecution and the investigative agencies have the ability to, to make a great impact on the TRC. This was a very painful chapter in the history of our country. And all of us within the MPA are committed to address these matters. We are committed to work with the families and the victims, and we are committed to work with those lawyers who are helping to try and solve these matters. Many of these matters go back really far into, into our history. Um, the starting date is 1961. And, and, and you will recall that the Truth and, and Reconciliation um, legislation was put in place to try and understand the picture that we had inherited because of the conflicts of the past and to get a true understanding of that and the gross uh, abuses and human rights violations that took place during that era. And we will recall that many people actually went to the TRC 
to go and give evidence and to apply for amnesty. And the TRC had the powers to grant amnesty. But there was a residual of matters which year their amnesty was not granted or where perpetrators did not come forward and apply for amnesty. And these are the cases that we are dealing with historically. And there's a legacy uh, over the years that these matters were not addressed correctly. And we do understand on the recommendation of the court and the NDPP to the minister that there must be an inquiry to establish what happened, why did the work not take place the way it should. And so we, we, we inherited that legacy. So what have we done? We have reorganized ourselves, as the NDPP has indicated. We have created additional capacity within the prosecution, and we've created a centralized model to deal with TRC work. So in effect, what we've done is to create a, a component within the prosecution that's dedicated to deal with TRC. And so we are currently, we have, we have a number of posts that are created throughout all our divisions under a centralized command within the prosecution at head office. And I will take personal responsibility to ensure that those cases that we are currently investigating are getting the necessary attention. And so out of uh, the matters that we currently have, and I'm just looking for uh, the numbers, I had it earlier, um, I will come back to to uh, to the numbers uh, that we are appointing and what and the progress that we've made in relation to that. Uh, but I'd like to address the Craddock Four matter. So an application was launched in the Craddock Four matter for the MPA to make a decision in relation to uh, uh, this particular case. Now at that time the MPA was not in a position to make a decision because there was not sufficient evidence to justify a prosecution of any individual in relation to those unfortunate uh, killings. Um, there was subsequently a discussion with the prosecutors who are from the Eastern Cape and uh, the lawyers were representing the uh, families and the victims um, in terms of this litigation. And this is how this date of the 2nd of December arose. It arose in good faith because the prosecutors try to reassure uh, the victims that they will be in a position to make a decision in the matter by then. What has subsequently happened is that we have uh, investigated the matters further. There's a long, complex history to this particular case, including the initial phases of the prosecutors and the investigators having to reconstruct the docket in this case. So a lot of work has been done over the last few months to bring this matter to a point where prosecutors are able to make a decision. Unfortunately, with the best intentions in the world, we are not able to meet that simply because the prosecutors are indicating that there are still aspects of this investigation that needs to be uh, done. And so that is our reality. And so from time to time, we do project timelines within the prosecution, within the management of our work. But it's a, it's a, it's a timeline. It's, it's trying to focus our minds to ensure that we all work towards that objective. And so that is what happened in this matter. And we then wrote on the 1st of December of this year to the lawyers to say, please give us an opportunity to try and resolve the outstanding issues. Now, what are the outstanding issues? The prosecutors have determined that the investigators have determined that there may be, this may be a matter where there were superior orders given in terms of the killing uh, of the Craddock Four. There seems to be information that, that there were discussions regarding the Craddock Four at very high level meetings within the country. Now, I I'm sure everyone will agree that we need to do that investigation thoroughly. We need to find out whether there's any new evidence that could be unearthed to justify the role of any other individuals in a conspiracy uh, to kill anyone within the country. So that is what this is about. And the prosecutors need time. And we need time to ensure that the administration of justice is, is, is the winner 
at the end of the day as far as uh, uh, this matter is concerned. So unfortunately, that is our position. We will work closely with the families and with the lawyers to ensure that, uh, that the matters are further investigated and that we're given a further opportunity to deal with this particular matter. Um, can I just ask the colleagues in the PP, I just need to give the figures for, uh, uh, for the dedicated capacity. So as far as the dedicated capacity is concerned, we, we have created a total of um, how much? 25 uh, posts uh, for the dedicated capacity. There are currently 13 prosecutors that have been appointed um, uh, in the MPA. We have five posts created in, in, the, in the province of KwaZulu-Natal. Those posts are still before. We have two posts created in the Western Cape. Two of those posts have been filled. We have four posts created in the Eastern Cape. One of those posts have been filled. We, in the DPP Northwest, we have one post full. Um, in North Gauteng, we have three posts. Two of those posts have been filled. In our head office, we've created four posts. Three have been filled, and we've got an additional one person appointed to uh, our head office component. In Limpopo, we have one post. One, one of those posts have been filled. Northern Cape, one post. Uh, that post must still be filled. Free State, one post. That post must still be filled. And Ntata, one post. That post must still be filled. So uh, we will ensure that this capacity uh, is in place as soon as possible. And then we are working very closely with the DPCI that has also a dedica dedicated capacity. What we mean by dedication is that this will be the sole responsibility of these, of these prosecutors. There are currently 59 cases that are under investigation, um, and there are still a further 55 cases that have to be referred, so a total of 104 cases. So with this dedicated capacity and the investigative capacity, we are confident that we are going to be able to, within a very short space of time, finalize all the outstanding investigations. We welcome the help from the lawyers, from the families, and we will give reports to all the families on the status of the matters. Thank you very much, NDPP. Thanks. Um, I, if you could also deal with your engagements with regard to the whistleblower issues. Just briefly, please. So as far as the, uh, the whistleblower uh, challenges in the country are concerned, uh, we, we need to say that we do have a witness protection program within the country. And that is currently the best uh, available institution that we have to secure the safety and the security of witnesses. But the system is a voluntary system. And so you apply to uh, for witness protection and there's a process that we follow to admit you onto the program and the mpa currently has a zero harm um, target in terms of people on in the witness protection and we are maintaining that zero harm target that we currently have the challenge occurs when people report crimes but they don't come forward as witnesses and so these are either informal uh, at an informal stage, or they may be witnesses in a particular matter. And the question arises, how do we support those witnesses? So this is an issue that we have been grappling with. And within the national um, anti-corruption strategy, it is an area that was looked at as well is in terms of how we address the situation of with whistleblowers. One of the recommendations that, ma that is made within the strategy is that we need to develop or, or look at developing a whistleblower agency within the country. That could be a one-stop shop for whistleblowers where we're able to give all the relevant support to our whistleblowers, which may include support around issues of victimization within the workplace, issues of safety, 
issues of having a lawyer to assist you um, when you lose your job, uh, issues of financial support, etc. And that work, I understand, will now fall under the auspices of the new council that the president has, has, uh, is going to appoint. And then within the ACTT, this is also an area that we are currently looking at. And we have then uh, um, requested that a team of people urgently look at additional measures that we can take to ensure that whistleblowers are protected, taking into account the witness protection program that we currently have. But I would like to request South Africans to come forward when we, when we do have information that we engage and through our prosecution service, especially with the senior people within the prosecution, the directors of public prosecution, the national director, the deputy national directors, that we must open our lines of communication because that is the way that we're going to Ronnie, ensure that, we just that the whistleblower... And just the highlights here and not to... Needs the attention. Sorry, Jim, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cock. Um, so just on, I think just to make the point on the whistleblower protection, you know, even though, yes, we, talk, we do have a, a witness protection program and we've talked about that, the reality is that the need to protect whistleblowers is a crisis in this country. And we really need, right now, we need to work together with uh, public sector entities, organizations. It's got to be a government and public sector um, partnership in order to try to address this really, really important issue. And we really need support from the highest levels of government to ensure that there is an immediate response to deal with this matter. Um, there's one or two, the, let me just check if they were, just to mention also on the issue of financial crimes. And I just want to, I want to just um reiterate, you know, what, what Advocate Cox said about capacity. Yes, within the NPA, we have really good experienced prosecutors. I think the point is, and he made it as well, is that we need to focus on getting these very specialized capacities like forensic, cyber capacities to ensure, and working with the private sector as well, to make sure that we're able to, where prosecutors lead investigations, we're able to have these very specialized capacities that assist and support them in their work. Um, with regard to financial crimes, I should say as well that just last week, the head of the FIC, um, Advocate Tolisile Kanile, um, myself and Advocate uh, General Labia uh, signed, uh, well, we're in the process of signing a memorandum of understanding. We, we had a meeting last week where we are basically putting together a cap capacity together. So the FIC staff will actually share, locate, co-locate with NPA staff in order to try to ensure that we deal more effectively with money laundering. So we are identifying cases and we're looking at particularly your standalone professional man money launderers who have very well pretty much escaped, um, you know, being, you know, the because of various challenges, they haven't hasn't really been a concerted effort to deal with this really re important contributor to uh, financial crimes in this country. So we are looking at um, doing this as a collective and also in order to deal with um, foreign predicate offending. So there's gonna be very targeted, we're selecting a couple of cases to make sure that we can have a dedicated capacity to deal with these issues. Um, I'm not sure if there's any other questions that and there was one question about the number of the prosecutors. So, you know, let me say that, you know, um, it's, 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 been, uh, it's been made public, the allegations against prosecutors, various prosecutors in, in the NPA. There's been evidence and testimony before the Zondo Commission. Prosecutors have been implicated. But that said, let me say that I have not experienced open, um, you know, uh, sabotaging of cases in the NPA. So, you know, we work with prosecutors. There are internal processes, as I said. We're waiting to see what the Zondo comes out of the Zondo Commission report. And we also, you know, uh, there's an, with regard to some uh, prosecutors, these investigations, internal investigations are quite an advanced stage. And so we need to allow those processes to continue. Thank you. Hello? Thank you, NDPP. Um, I think we, we're getting close to our last rounds. So I will um, firstly read the question from Newsroom Africa. 
Tolim Gambi. The question is, NDPP, can South Africans be assured that you won't resign before your term ends when the going gets tough? Mm-hmm. And, <laughs> and, and, and secondly, can you say without hesitation that there are no prosecutors who are deliberately sabotaging key cases like that of ESCOM, um, of ESCOM for example, which I think you has been addressed? And then after that, I will recognize Erin, Erin Bates. And after Erin, it will be Kyle Cowen. After Kyle, it will be Peter Dutoy. And this is all from News24. So I don't know if you are, you are asking all different questions. The last one is Karen Morn. In that order, please. Erin, are you still there? Maybe Erin, you must just write your question on the chat and we'll move on to um, so, uh, yeah. Kyle. Yeah. And after Hello. Kyle, Peter. Great, okay. Erin Bates. Okay, go Kevin ahead, Erin. Thank you. And thank you for this engagement. I know it's been a long morning. Just to follow up, I had a question earlier on whether or not the process of finding a new head of the ID has begun. If so, what details can you share? Then of the 100 members of the ID, how many are designated NPA prosecutors and how many are external hires? Then we at Business Day understand that staff within the ID are demoralized, not least with the head of the last few years leaving, and are looking for other positions because there's no clarity on the permanency of their jobs moving forward. What's being done on that score? And then finally, we heard earlier this year that there was at least plans to get red notices from Interpol for senior members of the Gupta family, including the trio of Gupta brothers. What is the status of those notices and what efforts have been made since we last engaged to get them extradited back to South Africa? And thanks again. Thank you, Erin. Kyle, are you there? Okay, we move on to Peter Dutoy. Thanks, Bulelwa. And then Karen um, after that. Thanks, Bulelwa. Uh, Advocate Dutoy, uh, you've over the last two years been remarkably transparent about the damage that was done to the NPA during capture and what the extent of the repairs that are needed um, are. You referred earlier in your briefing to the groundwork now being done, the ID being well positioned, and an advocate to cock just now spoke of being poised to act the NPA. Um, if you look over your last two years, what would you have done differently in this time? Are there instances where you could have, for example, intervened to ensure high profile cases are prosecuted faster or are there instances, instances where you could have acted more forcefully, for example, to get your way in regards to capacity, resources, or staffing? Um, because aren't isn't the only metric actually state capture crooks in orange overalls? Thanks. The final one is Karen for this round. Um, so two questions. First of all, just in relation to my question about... Um, Advocate Cornier, whether she genuinely wanted to leave or whether she left out of frustration um, and whether you can categorically say that this was um, something that she had absolutely no conflict about when she, when she resigned, um, given that we know that the president uh, did try and intervene in terms of addressing the kind of resource issues that she has vocalized both publicly and um, in parliament. 
And then second of all, just on the TRC cases, um, the reason that you, uh, Advocate de Kock gave was that there was an insinuation, a very obvious public insinuation, that there was high-level involvement from the State Security Council in the murders of Craddock 4. We have known for decades now that a military signal was given that those men must be permanently removed from society. In line of that, in line of the fact that that came out decades ago, I'm somewhat surprised that that is now a basis for which you vocalise, um, you know, an explanation for not making a decision in that case. Um, I do understand that the docket appears to have disappeared or been destroyed. I mean, that will, of course, form part of your investigation, inquiry into political interference in this matter. But can you seriously say that up until very recently, the NPA was not aware of the fact that there was a state security signal uh, given for the removal of these men and that high level ministers of the apartheid government, including the late former president, F.W. de Klag, was in, involved in that meeting? Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And, and then maybe the last question, NDPP, and then I think that will be it uh, as you address the questions for the last 10 minutes. Um, Sipo Masondo is asking, what is happening around the insurrection? Is the NPA doing any work around this matter? Thank you, Benelwa. So, I think I'm going to hand, Anton, maybe I'll just hand over to you to deal with the um, resources. And just to say that the process to, to find a new um, head of the ID is an ongoing process. We haven't yet clearly articulated the process, but hopefully um, we will be able to do so very, very soon. Anton? Thank you very much. I think there are two points to be made on capacity for the ID. And uh, it's been reported in the media that one of the reasons for, for the so-called frustration is, is the lack of capacity. And I think on, on one hand, that is the capacity we've been speaking about that Advocate de Kock and the National Director have raised in relation to the kinds of specialized capacity needed to prosecute these cases. And we've explained, uh, we explained in a bit of detail on how much more need, work needs to be done. So I won't go into that. But in terms of the actual capacity that exists currently within the ID, as we said, it's a it's a staff complement of about 120, just over that at this point. Um, of that, about 17 of those posts are permanent posts on the NPA structure, and the rest are part of the model. Because remember, the ID is a multidisciplinary model; it is set up to be um, to exist uh, with a, a range of stakeholders and and expertise. So there are a number of uh, secondees from the police, from the DPCI. There are secondees from other agencies like um, SIU, et cetera. And of course, within that context, there are also a number of contract staff. Now, one of the problems with, and it speaks to the point, I think one of the colleagues made about staff feeling demoralized in the ID. Don't forget that the ID was set up uh, essentially as a, as a temporary structure. It was set up for a five-year period to deal with a very finite uh, set of, of challenges coming from various commissions of inquiry, Bizondo being the most important one. Um, that structure, that legal structure that was uh, designed within the initial proclamation did create problems of permanence, a sense of stability within the unit, and that's natural. So one of the things we've done as the exco at the NPA is we've decided in light of the moving parts with the national anti-corruption strategy and the fact that we know that high-level corruption is not going to be going anywhere anytime soon, we've decided to capacitate the ID as if it is a permanent structure regardless of what the broader anti-corruption structure entity looks like, because we think that the NPA will always be the prosecution capacity having to deal with these cases. So what we've done is we've embarked on a very uh, comprehensive organizational design process, and uh, that process will wrap up in early 2022, uh, where there are a number of more permanent posts that are going to be created within the ID structure. We've asked for additional funding for this. We have a number of, uh, of innovative models around how we bring capacity into the ID in terms of the aspirant programs and younger people, as well as how do we attract uh, expertise from the private sector, from the bar, as the national director has just mentioned. So these are all key aspects of the, the strategy to capacitate the ID. I think what's also important to note is that um, the, uh, that the ID is very specifically being capacitated at the level of admin support and administrative support, 
Um, there is a, quite an, a strong admin unit in the ID as well as a management unit. There are a number of deputies in place as well as a chief operating officer and heads of, of various teams. So I think the narrative in the media that that the ID wasn't capacitated, wasn't given the political support. I think that is just uh, incorrect. Uh, of course, there are challenges still with the kinds of skills that the national director referred to, but it does speak to the question, I think, that Karen raised uh, about uh, frustrations with support. I mean, remember, this is happening within a bureaucratic state uh, environment. So, for example, even the building, of course, did take a bit longer than we would have wanted to, but it eventually did uh, come uh, come to fruition. So. I think that's on the question of, of, of the capacity and the OD. Thank you. Um, thank you, Anton. Um, on the issue of, um, you know, I, and I certainly hope, I know that, you know, colleagues in the ID, those that have joined the ID, have done so because of a passion and commitment for justice and to really hold people accountable for corruption in the country. And so in as much as, you know, there will be times, there, there will be many perhaps disappointed colleagues or you know, when leadership changes, there's there's uncertainty, but I certainly hope um, that colleagues in the ID, I don't just hope, I'm sure that they are, their commitment to the ideal of justice will make sure that they continue working. And I understand that they have expressed that they will ensure that they bring cases to court. And um, together with Advocate uh, Rabaji now, who will be working closely with Advocate Cronier to ensure that there's a smooth transition and these, these cases can actually be uh, hopefully fast-tracked and brought, brought quicker, sooner, even hopefully before Advocate Cronier leaves. Um, that will be great. Um, on the issue of um, you know, intervening in high-profile case, cases, I think the, the, what I should firstly say is that it's important to understand that decisions to prosecute or not to prosecute are taken by directors of public prosecutions and the investigating director and not by the national director. The national director is a review mechanism and ideally should not interfere in decisions to prosecute or not to prosecute, but to review these matters should it become necessary. And so, you know, it's, it's really important that we ensure that we actually maintain that um, legal requirement. Um, I think the resource issue Anton has dealt with, but I think perhaps what, what to do differently moving forward. I think there needs to be a razor sharp focus and, and a clear prioritization with regard to, to which are the case and clear case strategies in terms of how we're going to deal with very specific cases in terms of the strategy to deal with different aspects at different times. Because we won't always, in fact, it's very rare that you're able to get those most responsible, you know, after at a very after a very short space of time. It's you've got to build these cases. And so I think the the importance is going to be that there has to be really clear case strategies in terms of how we're going to work our way in order to ensure that those most responsible are held to account. Um, and and with regard to to the issue of um, the TRC cases, I'll ask Advocate uh, um, De Kock to deal with that uh, on the in, uh, on on the recent unrest in July. Um, the NPA has been working very very closely with the DPCI. Um, this has been one of the probably the the most devastating attacks on our constitutional democracy. And we've been, we've been engaging with um, the DPCI and, and they're, they're different categories of offenses very, very quickly, but you're looking at your offenders, the low level offenders, opportunistic looters. Then you're looking at your slightly higher level where there was more organized looting. Then you're looking at a category where there were, you know, um, intimidation and there was, um, there were a whole lot of social media posts where people were being encouraged to con to to join in the violence, and so we. And then you have the, the highest level, you know, those that actually planned um, the entire um, events that unfolded in July. And so it's important for us that you know we have different together with the police. We're looking at different approaches to the different categories of offenders. But it's critically important that those most responsible, those that actually planned and organized, 
are brought to book. And so, you know, the police, we're working with the DPCI who are investigating this matter. I know General Labia is very committed to ensuring that we do hold those responsible at the highest level to, in order to ensure that, this, that the possibility of this ever happening again is zero. So we working very we are working very very closely with the police and advocate Andrea Johnson is representing the NPA uh, in that forum. Um, Rodney, can you perhaps come in on on the follow up case on this TRC matter, and I'll check if there's anything outstanding. Yes, and there was also in relation to the unrest matters in DPP. I'm not sure if you want me to deal with that. May I proceed? Um, colleagues, I'm not sure if I'm being heard. Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you, Advocate. Uh, Thank you very much. So I requested uh, to the NDPP, uh, there was a question on the unrest matters. I'm not sure if I should address that as well. Perhaps you should indicate later. Um, so as far as the TRC uh, uh, and the issues raised uh, by the journalists, yes, we are aware of that. But the investigations, of course, is paramount to ensure that uh, we find the links to individuals that can be prosecuted. And so I think uh, in that context, uh, that is what I meant when I said uh, there's evidence uh, or potential evidence of additional uh, meetings that were held. And so uh, I'm not going to delve into the detail uh, of, of this. Um, and like the NDPP uh, indicated, uh, we can't be doing uh, this kind of level of detail in a press briefing or in the media. So uh, the point is just that we're taking these matters very, very seriously. In this case in particular, we're going to do all in our power to ensure that we can as quickly as possible find the additional evidence that's required so that a decision can be made one way or the other. Just bear in mind, if there's no evidence linking any particular individual that we can prosecute in a criminal trial, then unfortunately we have to refer the matter or request that the inquest be reopened in this particular case. So that is what we're currently dealing with. NDPP, I'm not sure about the unrest matters. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, no, I think that's fine. We are also running out of time. Um, just to mention that the investigating directorate is dealing with the issue of the red notices with regard to the, to the Guptas, um, and there are certain challenges in that regard. And then I think the final question that I, I didn't answer was whether I was going to resign when the going get tough. Um, resignation is not an option, but we, together with the team that we're putting together, it's, I, I feel very, very confident that I have a really good, strong executive committee. We have a good, strong manco, and we're also looking to, to permanently appoint DPPs very, very soon. And, and, I, I came back from the Netherlands and took on this job not to resign when the goings get tough. There's a commitment, not just by me, but my entire EXCO, that we are here. There are so many members of EXCO that have made tremendous sacrifices to come back to the NPA, to rebuild the NPA, and to make sure that we help to contribute to the rebuilding of the country. I'm not even going it's, to, it's just, it's, it's something I'm not even going to consider or think about. We're here for the long haul. We're here to make sure that we end this journey and that we really together build this IPAC NPA that, that we want to independent, professional, accountable, and credible. So no, resignation is not an option. We've got to get the job done. And together, I, I, as hard as it is, I feel confident that we, we, we will succeed. Not as, not as quickly as, as many people would like, but we are trying really, really hard and we will continue to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you, National Director. That, that brings us to the end of this briefing, colleagues. As you can see, the time is um, 12 o'clock on the dot. 
I do recognize that there may be one or two questions that maybe were not um, addressed. Which um, so, for instance, Kyle, you were you were not unmuted when you wanted to ask a question, but I commit that we we have seen your question and we will be able to respond to you in writing. Um, yes, then then that's that's it for this morning's session, colleagues. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time, and the national director is is very pleased to have had this engagement at last because it has it has really been. Um, long outstanding, and we commit in future that we will we will really try and get and get more of it going. Especially we we this was our first virtual briefing, national director. So um, I think now that we've got the hang of it, we will actually do more of them more often. So thank you very much, media colleagues. That's the end of the briefing for today. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.